Crossroads Media. Oh, this team sucks. This team sucks. What doesn't suck, though, is the giveaway that I am currently running over on my Twitter, at Broads81. I am giving away a Ben Simmons City Edition jersey. Top of my profile, pin tweet. It explains the rules. Get there right now. Do not be a fool. Enter to win this giveaway. Every Wednesday, there is a new one. Also, if you're new to the channel, hit that subscribe button right now. Also, smash the like button on this video as well. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you so much, and enjoy the show. What is going on, everyone? The Philadelphia Phillies lose their fourth straight game. They fall 4-3 to three to the Boston Red Sox, and there's so much that I want to dive into with this specific game. Bryce Harper was miserable yet again. Spencer Howard and the debacle of what the hell is going on with his velocity because it's a joke for it to fall and dip to this insane level after just a couple of innings. It's pathetic, really, if you ask me. And the offense. And actually, too, someone who has not been hard on Joe Girardi, I thought Joe Girardi messed up on the most typical standard baseball 101 managerial move that seriously makes me feel disgusted inside. And it's embarrassing that we are here today. This team is starting to show its ugly head. I know that there's injuries with Didi and JT, and you're not truly getting the roster and the lineup that you would have anticipated to start the season. But guess what? You got to prevail. You got to make sure that you still win baseball. Everyone's going through injuries. Do you see what's going on with the New York Mets? Do you see what's going on with the Atlanta Braves? And to be fair, they're not just going on these crazy runs. They are struggling at points as well. At the same time, no excuse. No excuse. Go out, take care of business, win baseball games. These games are winnable. That's the difference. The way I see this with the Phillies, they're winnable. They have moments. Or they shoot themselves in the foot in such an ugly way that they take themselves out of the game and they're not making mistakes because they're injured. Gene Segura is just not making a standard baseball play. Bryce Harper's just missing a ball out in right field. Andrew McCutcheon can't make a simple play at the wall or keep a ball out in front of him after a single gets hit through the infield. So they're not losing games because of injuries and all. They're just not making the most basic baseball plays from their actual players that you are supposed to rely on. So that's why I see it in a different view, which makes me upset. But I guess I'll try my best to keep this in chronological order, even though, you know me, I'll get sidetracked and go off on a different conversation probably within minutes of this damn podcast. But we'll, we'll try our best, and we'll start with Spencer Howard. I thought he was awesome in the first inning, two strikeouts. Awesome in the second inning, three strikeouts, although he did have a hit batter. From there, he actually fell apart. He fell apart after two Innings. The fastball, awesome. Off speed, awesome. But then the command went to shit. On top of that, the velocity the velocity dropped to this to this crazy, crazy level. And I'm telling you, there's got to be an issue. There's no way a, a healthy individual dips off that quickly. And that's why he wasn't being caught up when they were constantly throwing out Matt Moore or Chase Anderson. I'm just speculating. I don't have any sort of information. But there's got to be a correlation between what we saw last year with the shoulder injury, what we're seeing now with the dipping of the velocity. His slowest pitch was 90.4 miles per hour. He was also gunning high 97 as well. So you're telling me within two innings, two innings, Innings after two innings, you go back out for the third, and that's what we witness. It's horrendous. Early, his seven of nine fastballs were touching 96 miles per hour. You go to the third inning, and we're talking 93, 91, three walks, including the opposing pitcher. And yeah, he didn't have help with defense out in right field with Bryce Harper with that dive. It was a tough play. It was a maximum effort type of dive out in right field. I'm not going to crucify the man for not making the catch. It was a difficult catch to make. He did everything he could and exploded over to right field to even try and make that diving attempt to begin with. But that wasn't a poor play, in my opinion, on Bryce Harper. That wasn't one that makes me 
disappointed or give me an upsetting feel. I think it was a tough play to make. He left everything out there on the field in that particular moment, and he could not come up with it. He came up just shy. That allowed the the Red Sox to score a couple runs that inning. They took a 2 to nothing lead. But, yeah, I mean, you're telling me you go from awesome off-speed, a pitch coming inside out of the zone that's fooling batters, high cheese, upper 90s, swinging a miss, striking out three in the second inning, utilizing a changeup that makes me feel nasty in a good way. You see that changeup, and I'm going, ew, that's gross, seeing the changeup involved. And all of a sudden, you become horrendous. I would have to think that there's an injury involved. That's the only thing that makes sense. You start the fourth inning, you walk the first batter, and there you go. You're done. See you later. We were sold. Spencer Howard was top end of the rotation. That's garbage. Garbage. He's not even close. He's 24 years old. Am I going to write him off completely? No, I'm not. And the best example could possibly be Zach Wheeler. Now, I'm not going to tell you that Zach Wheeler and Spencer Howard are exactly the same, but here's the philosophy I have with Zach Wheeler. There was, a, there was a stretch where he couldn't stay healthy and he had electric stuff, but he couldn't really utilize it properly. And the Mets decided it's time to move on from a pitcher like Zach Wheeler. Well, here comes the Phillies. They signed him to the big contract. Zach Wheeler has really solidified himself as your purest pitcher, your most consistent pitcher, and he is really successful on the mound for you. He wasn't always that way. And when I look at Spencer Howard, he's 24 years old. He's clearly battling some sort of discomfort with the shoulder. Just because you go through one year, two year, three years of going through a situation with yourself physically, it doesn't mean you can never figure it out and you can never get to a, a spot in your career where you feel comfortable and you have a groove. That happened with Zach Wheeler. Not the same. I'm not saying it's exactly the same, but there was some question marks surrounding if he's ever going to be able to stay healthy enough to even have a season where he feels great, where he can throw the ball very well, where he can be a dominant pitcher. We're seeing that now. We really are. And Zach Wheeler, we all say if there's a one-game situation for the Phillies, we want his number called. We want his ass on the bump. We want to see that slider and that fastball combination. We want to see that fastball command. We want to see that 7% curveball that he utilizes that drops and you can't even touch it if you wanted to. Is there a correlation that maybe we see something like that with, with Spencer Howard one day? Possibly. He's 24 years old. There's no way I can write him off forever. But at best, you're talking back end of the starting rotation. And quite honestly, you see someone who can give you one or two innings before he becomes a disaster with velocity and command. You almost think bullpen piece. One excuse that I hated after the game, and he's young. I'm not saying that he's making excuses fully. I think he's just very raw to the media and just being completely honest. And Joe Girardi alluded to this as well. Because he was on the bases running or he was running the previous inning, that that really impacted his heart rate and that impacted his emotions and that impacted his adrenaline and that impacted everything. So when he went out on the mound, he did not give himself enough time to settle, to breathe, to exhale. And there's something to that. To pretend like it's not a real thing, there's a reason why you talk about the heartbeat of a pitcher. Someone who has poise, someone who's calm, someone who doesn't look like the moment's too big and you're understanding, you're you're calmly take the next pitch, you'll go in to lean in for the pitch, you'll read the pitcher, you get your signs, you come to a stop, you look smooth or you don't look smooth, you look very active or you don't look very active. You can read the body language of a pitcher to get a sense on how they're feeling emotionally. Well, he thinks that, you know, putting effort out and, and running in that inning before, he didn't get to cool down and that forced him in that, next inning to somewhat be all over the place. Maybe something to it. At the same time, though, I don't want to hear it. I don't want to hear it personally. Extremely disappointed in the Spencer Howard start. I look at Nick Maton, and Nick Maton got his number called. And what did he do at that moment? He took control of it. Nick Maton, we look at Nick Maton as a fun, young, exciting player 
who had a chance, and he made the most of that chance to the point where when Nick Maton's name is brought up, you have actual dialogue about it. You talk about finding ways to get him in the lineup. You got to find a way when Gene Segura comes back to keep him in. You got to find a way when Didi Gregorius comes back to keep him in. Now, he's not hitting the 400 that he was hitting before, which we knew was going to dip at some point. You figured there would be a little bit of reality check and realistic expect, or you know, your expectations get back to the norm, if you will. And you're you're seeing that with Nick Maton. His number got called, though, and Nick Maton is a name that you still have conversation about and you debate if he deserves to be in and should he be in over Torres, even though Joe Girardi's decision to go with Torres has clearly benefited him because Torres has been really successful since coming back from that stint with COVID and whatnot. He even had a really big pinch hit in this game in the seventh inning that eventually forced bases loaded and... Well, we'll get to that in just a minute. I just wanted to have my finishing touches on the Spencer Howard debacle. You got your number called, Spencer. And you were lights out in the beginning. Those first two innings, I was thoroughly enjoying it. I thought there was something to it. And I figured, look, I knew he was on a pitch count. And I knew that you would get to about 70 pitches or so. If you could get 70 pitches and get through... I'm just saying, if you can get through four and two-thirds or five innings with that type of effort, striking out five strikeouts and being smooth, I'll take that all day long, knowing that you're on that pitch count. You start to see all these walks in the command going to shit. It bothered me. So you didn't, you didn't make the most of the opportunity. And as a, as a top prospect in the organization, that's the way you're viewed. That's what we were told. That's the way you're looked at. When your top prospect finally gets called after whatever you want to call last season for him, and you give him a free pass because of the COVID year, because of the shortened season, because of the shoulder problem, because of how long it took for him to warm up at times, it wasn't right, and we knew it wasn't right. The following season, knowing that there's a problem with your four, with your five, and Matt Moore and Chase Anderson, even though Vince Velasquez has somewhat solidified himself, at least for right now, in that area, there's another spot wide open. Been the number one prospect in your farm system gets the phone call and he, he gives you that effort. It does not taste very good. I'll tell you what tastes very good though. This cup of coffee. This cup of coffee right now I need. I desperately need. Normally I do the post game shows after the game is over. But I, I'm doing this one in the morning the, the next morning. I woke up at 545 to, to record this bad boy because I know the Phillies play at 1. I know the Sixers play at 1 on this Sunday. So it's like, you know, hey, we'll get up early. We'll have a cup of coffee. So, you know, I, I need this right now. I definitely need this. It, it tastes good. Spencer Howard doesn't taste good. Cup of coffee tastes good. And we'll get into, oh, 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 oh. we'll get into that seventh inning in just one second here. So everything leading up to the seventh inning, the Phillies were down 2 nothing. Miller gets a triple. Oduba with a sack fly, 2-1. to one. Here comes Coonrod, allows two homers, Bogarts and Santana. Santana murdered Aaron Nola the other day, if you remember, too. So he keeps that hot streak alive of crushing the baseball. Here's what I'll say about Coonrod, and I just find it so damn ironic. And every Phillies podcast over the last three or four has somewhat just bounced off of one another. And what I mean by that is, when we date back to Miami Marlins series a few games ago, when Alvarado was on the mound and Jazz hit a two-run home run to take a 3-1 to one lead late, I got a tweet from an individual saying Joe Girardi is an idiot. Joe Girardi is a moron. Why would you go with Alvarado when you could go with Kinsler, when you could go with Coonrod, when you can go with other pitchers? And I tried to explain. It was not a bad decision. The execution was poor. The decision of going with Alvarado late in the baseball game is a fine decision. I'm going to rip Joe Girardi for a bad decision in this game specifically in just a moment. But going with Alvarado, not bad. Then Kinsler ends up getting another, another game from there. He has a bad game. Coonrod was a name that was mentioned. Why don't you go with Coonrod? Well, you put Coonrod in this game, and he fails. There's no obvious answer. You don't have obvious bullpen pieces, all right? I can't stress it enough. All of these pitchers are going to fail. It's just, are they going to fail on that particular night? Or are they going to get through the inning on that particular night? 
But going to Coonrod in this spot, would that make him an idiot? Or would that just make him picking another guy that is in that same area that can be utilized in that specific inning? It doesn't matter who Joe goes to, unless your name is David Hale and Matt Moore before he went on the IL. There are certain guys that, all right, Joe, if you go to Matt Moore in a high leverage spot, I think we could all rip you into shreds. If you go to Coonrod, if you go to Archie Bradley, if you go to Alvarado, if you go to Kinster, although Kinster at this point has somewhat of a track record, he's starting to to dwindle into that into that side of, hey, maybe you should limit when he goes in and you should really pick and choose certain areas when he goes in because he's not having the best of seasons if you look at his ERA this year. Going to these players, though, it it doesn't matter which one you choose. All of them are supportive. All of them make sense for the most part. There are situations where it may not, but that hasn't happened over the last few. Just because it didn't work it doesn't mean, oh, you shouldn't have went to Coonrod there. Going to Coonrod there was fine. It didn't work. But going to Coonrod there was fine. Are you now screaming that you should have went to Alvarado in that spot? Or you should have called Archie Bradley? Or you should have went to another name? Or you should have went to another guy? No. Coonrod failed. But it wasn't a bad idea to put Coonrod in. He failed. So I just think it's so damn funny that that tweet, I keep going back to that tweet, and it's been the last four games that Joe Girardi was such a terrible manager in that moment for going to Alvarado. And all the names that were mentioned in that same tweet at that moment have got their chance to go on the mound, and they failed since that tweet came at me. So what does that tell you? It tells you everything I've been trying to tell you, and that every next game, it just it helps me that much more. That data and information that we see of these bullpen people, I don't want to see them fail. I don't. But it does support my logic on what I'm trying to tell you. Going to these players in these moments, before you know the outcome, not really a problem. Once you see the outcome, well, you can't just start bitching and complaining from that point that it was such a terrible philosophy if it doesn't work. No, it's the philosophy and the blueprint makes sense. The execution, not so much. All right, so it's a 4-1 to one game at that point. Hoskins finally gets his 100th homer. If you remember the debacle against, was that the Braves where it was that crazy game and the top of the fence, did it hit the top of the fence, did not the top of the fence. Oh, it was just miserable, just miserable. Well, we thought that was going to be his 100th homer. Ended up not being his 100th homer, to, well, yesterday, I should say. It was. He gets it. It was crushed to left field. I made it a 4-2 to two game. All right, here's the seventh. Here's the seventh. Excuse me. I need one more sip of coffee here, and and then we'll we'll heavily get into this. Marshawn, Torres, both get on base. Segura gets hit by a pitch. So there's one out because Andrew McCutcheon gets out, and Bryce Harper is up. This was probably the worst that bad I've ever seen out of Bryce Harper in a high leverage spot. One out, bases loaded, down two runs. Three pitches, two of them he looked right at. First pitch, stared right at it. Second pitch, fouled it back. Third pitch, right down the pipe, stared right at it and walked to the dugout. Bang, bang, bang. Smell you later, Bryce Harper. Man, that that was really tough to watch. Two looking, I I just couldn't believe it that that was what we witnessed out of Bryce. he's He's just so damn defeated right now. He's two for 25. With 13 strikeouts and one walk in his last 17 games, he went 0 for 5 yesterday with three strikeouts. We just are not used to seeing Bryce Harper play this way. He goes through ugly stints. He goes through, quote, downfalls in a season, and he'll give you your high highs and your low lows. But this is as bad of a stretch as you're going to see out of Bryce Harper for sure. He's going to sit for this Sunday afternoon game. It makes sense. It's going to significantly hinder your team and your roster and all. But at the same time, when he's giving you this type of play and this type of effort on both sides of the field as well, he hasn't been the greatest defender either. So, I mean, it's how much worse can it be? He needs a refresher. He needs it physically. He needs it mentally. I'm not worried that this is going to be him. See, this is what I can't stand. The whole, oh, he's a waste. Oh, this was pathetic. Oh, this was brutal. Like the contract that is and how much of a waste he is. If you're going to react to 17 games of a 13-year contract and say this is who he is and it's such a waste, well, then you're, you're just uneducated. You're, you're uneducated. 
I'm not happy about it. I'm not thrilled about it. I'm not pumped up about it. But I'm not going to act as if just because Bryce Harper goes through a little bit of a tough spot here that he's just miserable forever and it was the worst signing we've ever seen out of the franchise. I just mentioned to you how tough it's really been. And 2 for 25 in a 17 game stretch is going to absolutely hurt your batting average. He's hitting 275 right now this year. So what was he hitting before? Let's let's look at it. Uh very well. <laughs> okay. Uh very very strong. At one point he was hitting 318. So on May 14th, which was 9 days ago, Bryce Harper was hitting 318. So I'm just saying, he's hitting 274 now. Um, how bad the stretch has been, you get knocked down to 274. So that only means 318 was what he was doing just nine days ago. So all of a sudden, Bryce Harper was a waste. But nine days ago, he was amazing and he was tremendous and he was a rock star. Now he's the worst player ever and you just wasted so much money. It just doesn't go that way, right? Freddie Freeman, to start the year, was a disgrace. I love Freddie Freeman. He's a pro's pro. He's amazing at the sport. He's just awesome for the game of baseball, and you want him in your clubhouse. He was starting the season out horrendously. Trash baseball for a few weeks, and then he faced the Phillies. He snapped out of it, started to hit home runs, but does that mean Freddie Freeman is a disaster of a baseball player because for two weeks or so to start the year he was an embarrassment? No. But you're getting that right now with Bryce Harper. And yeah, you pay the man to step up. You pay the man to, to make sure that he stops the bleeding for this franchise when they go through ugly ruts, especially when he has a chance in the seventh and he has a chance in the ninth inning as well. He ends up grounding out to first base, which moved a runner over to nine. Torres gets on in the ninth. And he was at third base for Reese Hoskins. You couldn't knock that runner in to tie the baseball game. At that point, it's a 4-3 to three baseball game. Top of your lineup up. Couldn't do it. So he had two, two opportunities and, and failed in both. It's not great. It's definitely not great. He needs he needs to relax. He needs to take a deep breath and, and somewhat sit down just for a little bit to regroup and hit the refresh button, and that's okay. Let's not go overboard, though, and claim that Bryce Harper is some bum forever because of it. Here's what really upsets me, though, with Joe Girardi in that seventh inning. So that made it two outs. Two outs, bases loaded. Hernandez is up. You got your lefty-lefty. He was up for Bryce Harper as well. Uh, Hoskins gets hit by a pitch after that. So he ended up hitting Gene Segura. This wasn't Hernandez. This was the previous pitcher, though. Ends up hitting Segura, which loaded the bases originally. Bryce Harper then struck out. Reese Hoskins gets hit with a pitch. That walks in a run. Now the score is 4-3. to three. Brad Miller up. Why? Why? That is your most... Baseball 101 managerial move to go to Alec Bone there. I, you can't write that up any easily, any more easier than that. Joe, you have a lefty on the mound. Alec Bone, who is your starting caliber player in your lineup, is getting the day off, and he's going to play later on in the game, which made it even more head scratching. And there was a little bit of me that thought because after last game, when he had that cutoff play at home. He said, we'll take care of that. Joe Dry said, we'll take care of that with Alec Boehm because he cut off the play, made a poor throw to Gene Segura, and it got a little ugly there. I wonder if the statement was, they say rest day, but if it was more of a sit your ass down kind of day because you're not paying attention to what you're supposed to be doing. I'm just speculating. I don't know if that was the case, but I thought maybe it was. So Alec Boehm, they weren't playing Alec Boehm to make a statement name of you can't be making those costly mistakes in the field to give the innings a longer or to give the other team a longer inning, to give the other team a secondary moment to try and tack on more runs. He ends up hitting in the eighth inning, though, because of a double switch when you allow an inning to prolong because you make a mistake in the field, and here we go. Now we got to change pitchers. We got to bring in Hector Neris. The inning stays alive, yada, yada, yada. We've seen that 7,000 times. So Alec Bohm was available. Why are we going lefty-lefty Brad Miller on Hernandez there? Baseball 101, dude. Like, what are we doing here? 
Why are we not having Alec Boehm pinch hit in that moment? Now, I'm not claiming that Alec Boehm with bases loaded was coming up with a grand slam. He has not been sharp. He has not been the best Alec Boehm in the batter's box, and he's looked overmatched. So I don't know what would happen. It's very possible that Alec Boehm would have struck out there. All I know is I'll take my chances with Alec Boehm any day of the week in that moment over lefty-lefty Brad Miller. And Alec Boehm ends up coming in in a double switch the following inning. I really can't wrap my head around the logic. And that's where I go back to, what is the logic heading in? Do I support the logic first? I don't care about what happens. Hindsight afterwards, okay, we'll have that discussion later. Going into the at-bat, Going into the pitching change, going into the bullpen choice, going into the lineup card, going into it before we see what actually transpires, does it make sense? Not going to Alec Boehm made no sense to me. And that, that's that's baseball 101. Uh, baseball 101. Why are we going to Brad Miller lefty lefty, bases loaded seventh inning when you have Alec Boehm a righty on the bench? That is a disastrous call by Joe. Honestly. I've been hard on the individuals that have ripped Joe insanely. And I'll keep it 100, though. At the end of the day, this team is two games under 500 with or without Joe Girardi. With the new manager, with a different manager, guess what? You have the same product. You have the same team. So the number one reason why your squad is where it's at is not Joe Girardi, to be fair. With that being said, though, Joe, come on, dude. Come on. How do you not see that one? How did that one slip right by you? It's a joke. It, it really is. It's a joke. Joke. Non-move by Joe Girardi. The offense struck out 13 more times. That's obviously the storyline of this year's baseball season. But as I alluded to before, I watched the Red Sox in game one of this series strike out 17 times or so, 18, 19 times. Then maybe it was 17 times. Hold on, I think I wrote it down here in my notes in my notebook from yesterday's game uh, or two days ago, I guess, at this point. I'm not used to recording it the morning after. I'm used to recording it the day of. So my tomorrows and todays are getting all sloppy. Red Sox, 17 strikeouts in that 11-3 loss by the Phillies. So their offense was rocking. They hit 11 runs in. And they also struck out 17 times. It's not about the strikeouts. It's about the production offensively with the strikeouts. Both can be true, except you really didn't get much. You know, Brad Miller got on a couple times. Uh, Torres was a spark. Reese Hoskins with the homer. There you go. That's, that's kind of what you saw out there, unfortunately. Extremely disappointing. De Simone Jewelers doesn't disappoint, though. I went to them for my fiance's engagement ring. She fell over when she saw it. I went back for Christmas. She fell over right into the tree. It was terrible. Birthday gift. She fell over. You name it. She fell over whenever I give her a piece of jewelry from De Simone Jewelers. They are the best in the business. Family owned for over 40 plus years. They move from Jewelers Road to Haddonfield, New Jersey. They do not use sale tactics. They show you options and they educate their customers and they treat you like family. They customize and manufacture every ring they make from start to finish on location. Because of that, they're able to beat competitors' prices. You should have seen the necklace I got my fiance. It was gorgeous and the price Mwah, right on the money. No pun intended. I've sent so many family members and friends in their direction. I constantly get back the same reaction. Wow, they're unbelievable. You'll see exactly what I mean when you go in there and you tell them that Broads sent you. All right, let's hit some anytime hotline calls here. Oh, man. Here we go. I'll say this for the Philadelphia Phillies offense. If you're a person that has trouble sleeping at night, if you toss and turn, if you can't get comfortable in bed, just watch this team for about three innings swing the bat. It'll knock you right out. You know, Hunter, they say the athletes of today are bigger, stronger, faster, and that's probably true. But in the Phillies' case, they're dumber, too. I mean, in the span of one key inning, I watch Andrew McCutcheon swing at a ball with two strikes from his shoe tops. Bryce Harper takes strike three right down the middle, and Brad Miller swing at a pitch five feet above his head. This is why this team sucks now and will suck the rest of the year, 
and hopefully next year Dombrowski can rip this thing apart and start over again because they are just anemic offensively. Unfortunately, you're right. That's what they need to do. They got to tear this thing down. Tearing this thing down and rebuilding it the proper way is going to take some time. And that means we're probably going to go through, if they do this, and I don't think they're going to because they committed to Bryce Harper, they committed to JT Real Mucho. If you bring in Dave Dombrowski, you're not rebuilding. Dave Dombrowski's a go-getter. Dave Dombrowski's a let's go get it and let's go be aggressive and let's go, you know, in attack mode essentially. And I know with the Tigers, there was a, a building process with it, uh, but this is a mess. You have nothing to start with internally with your entire prospect pool. You have to start from literally below the ground and inch your way up. So it's going to be horrendous if they go down that road, and I can't imagine that actually happening. But that's probably the best for this franchise. You don't commit to Bryce Harper, JT, and all that and, and do it. So that's where I think they're stuck in this middle ground of I don't know if they have the opportunity to start up and, and start back from the bottom and, and rebuild and retool this entire team the proper way. I also wonder how much Dave Dombrowski's bought into this thing. There was that whole drama about Nashville and starting a team there, and then this came along, and maybe this is just a stopgap, and if it is just a stopgap, how emotionally tied is he to doing the right thing and making all the proper decisions? I don't know. I don't know how bought in he really is here, but this is bad, you know, and I don't know what the fix is because you don't have the options to call up all these players. Move, what, what if? So Andrew McCutcheon, out of here. Let's say you trade Reese Hoskins, move Bowman, to first base, and then you get a third baseman. So if you get a new first, a, 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 a new left fielder, a new third baseman, or let's say you move Gene Segura to third, you can get something happening at second base, something along the lines of a new infielder, and that's what you have: new left fielder, new infielder. Is that enough to spark something new with this team? And then I don't know what you're going to do out in the outfield with Oduble and, and things of that nature, but. I don't know. I don't know. And and in terms of how brutal this offense is and whatnot, yeah, I, I'm with you. I, I'm with you. It's you know, I was early in the season saying they'll eventually snap out of it because you know, four, five, six, seven, eight games into a season, it would be very unfair to say that that's who that team is going to be forever. With the knowledge of knowing that it quite possibly can be too, the alternative is yeah, it can be. But I was willing to give them some time. This is reality of the situation, and you could talk about it being a problem with the sport, but I see other teams do just fine. If you're watching a Padres team that, off the top of my head, somewhere around 28 and 17, if you watch some of these other teams like the Boston Red Sox, they strike out a fuck ton too, but they're not boring to watch. It's not a bad brand of baseball. So it's not the, the fact that you're striking out so much that's making this unbearable and making the sport unbearable. It's the Phillies that's making it unbearable. It's not the, the game and the way the game is played because I see plenty of other explosive, super fun, entertaining baseball teams that strike out a lot, but they just match that with a lot of hitting too. So it's just the fact that this Phillies team can't hit. It's not the approach because this same approach is applied throughout all baseball and it works and it's fun and I'm watching out-of-market games and I'm thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyed with it. It's just the fact that the Phillies can't do it, which is annoying. And will things change if JT comes back, if DD comes back and your lineup gets deeper and that helps out a player like Alec Bohm because of not going to go full on protection, but you know, if you know that there's a lot more players involved in this lineup that are scarier, it can open the door for Alec Boom. I don't know if that's really the answer, though, because we've seen this team struggle with those players in the lineup as well. What's up, bro? The Phillies lose. Bottom of the night thing to the Red Sox. Hoffman's not the hit. Harper, man, Harper is really going bad, man. Like, I feel like he might, he might need to get like like a mental trick or something, because he is doing really, really, really bad in the time. It's funny. I feel like uh, Howard did really good in the beginning, but he struggled the second time to the lineup. But he can be good, but he was on a pitch count limit, but he struggled the second time to the lineup, though. I, I think our bullpen did pretty good, though. But it was just a rough game. I mean, these Red Sox are really good of a team. I feel like they're the best team in the AL. But it's a hard game again. If the Phillies don't lose, win tomorrow, it's just bad, bro. Yeah, no, it's bad. It, it, it's it's real bad. You're right about the Red Sox, though. The Red Sox are a good team. The, the Red Sox are a very good team, and you could see that. But imagine watching that for 162. Imagine watching that team for 162. That would be so much fun. 
It would be so much fun. So don't tell me the sport of baseball is bad because you're just stuck watching the Phillies. You're stuck watching a disastrous franchise try and play baseball. There's nothing worse than bad baseball. Bad baseball is the absolute absolute worst thing to sit through because there's so many games. And that's why we feel the way we do about the sport right now. Some of us. I mean, I love it, but I just know the, the storylines behind the sport is it's a major problem. It's not if you're good. It's not if your team's actually exciting. You mentioned the bullpen. So here's a little bit of the bullpen. Um... And by the way, Nathan for the Red Sox went five and a third, two earned runs, four strikeouts, five hits, two walks as well, and 85 pitches. And they went heavy on their bullpen, and their bullpen pretty much shut the door, except for Valdez, who was hitting batters and whatnot in that seventh inning. All right, so Ranger Suarez had a very strong two innings, actually. Two innings, one strikeout, 21 pitches, pretty clean along the board. Coonrod struggled. Alvarado went one inning, allowed one hit, and walked one. Kinser went two and a third, allowed two hits, and had one strikeout. And Hector Neris went one and one third and was pretty clean with it. So, yeah, you're right. Other than Coonrod and a couple hits that Kinsler allowed. And on, he did not have the best defensive help when Kinsler was out there, which it, it cost this team. It just in general, not tonight specifically, but just in general. When you do that and you make the – now Kinsler's got to throw more. Or Hector Neris has to come in. And now, like, think about this. All these times the Phillies pitchers – go through an issue where they have to throw more innings and they're forced to play longer. Let's say you would have got out of the inning with 12 pitches. Now you got to throw 16 or 17 or 18. And now you do that for two or three innings. Now you're throwing 20-something more pitches that you should have thrown, and that limits what you can do for your start. And that's been something that happens every single night with this baseball team. You saw that in the eighth with Kinsler, and it just sucks. It sucks what we watch. It sucks, and it's, it's very brutally painful. So, unfortunately, that's where we're at. Before we head out of here, make sure you go to DraftKings Sportsbook and utilize promo code BROACH when you sign up for all these phenomenal odds and promotion boosts that are available. There's promotions and odds boosts, I should say, that are available for you. Promo code BROACH. You have the NBA playoffs. Last night, we watched some great games, whether it was Dallas and Portland. Earlier in the afternoon, you had the Milwaukee Bucks going to overtime. Chris Middleton with the monster bucket. You can check out the over-unders for the game, for the half. You can check out the over-under for the player props. It's a no-brainer. Joel Embiid, and even for the Phillies. Whoever the Phillies are playing, look at the starting pitcher on the other side and hammer the over for the strikeout total. I mean, it's inevitable that that's going to hit. Go to your download or go to your app store, download the DraftKings Sportsbook app, and use promo code BROADS when you sign up. That is promo code BROADS. It is a no-brainer. All right, thank you all so much, and I will see you next time.